the monroe kelly doctrine presumably the most important theory of neurological disorders this doctrine cannot be unseen once you see it a theory or a hypothesis was formulated some centuries ago by two scottish doctors namely dr alexander monroe secundus and dr george kelly both of whom changed neuropathology and its treatment forever this theory is important in so many ways as it guides the management of various brain disorders and helps us understand an important phenomenon of all traumatic brain injuries so what does this theory says it states that due to the limited space available in the intracranial cavity the sum of volumes of brain the cerebrospinal fluid and intracranial blood remains constant an increase in one should cause a decrease in one or both of the remaining two components now this theory just looks weak but what does all this means in clinical application let me explain it to you in a better way unlike all the other organs our brain sits inside a close hard box made up of bones called the cranium this cranium limits the space for any expansion of the brain tissues which would mean that a tumor or any swelling in the brain cannot occur without the bones coming directly in contact with the brain tissues now it's not just the brain tissue that is present inside the cranium but it also includes the cerebrospinal fluid and the blood supply to the brain all these three components exerts a pressure onto the bony cavity and exist in equilibrium with each other because increase in any one of the component can increase the pressure within the cranium if a person gets a blow to the head and if the blow is hard enough to cause injury to the brain then we all know that the brain will not only bleed but also there will be swelling of the injured tissues this means that the brain volume increases which will now increase the pressure to bring the pressure back down the csf circulation and the blood supply to the brain will be reduced the estimate of the volumes present within a cranium is brain mass 1400 g blood volume 150 ml and csf volume 150 ml thus giving us a total volume of 1700 ml now say that the brain mass increases by 100 g extra the blood volume may decrease to give us a constant of 1700 ml of volume thus the equation becomes 1700 ml equal to 1500 g of brain mass 50 ml of blood volume and 150 ml of the csf volume now if the brain volume had to increase to 200 ml extra then the blood supply either has to stop or it has to reduce along with the reduction in csf levels thus the equation becomes 1700 g equal to 1600 ml of brain volume plus 50 ml of csf volume plus 50 ml of blood supply total cessation of blood supply or csf does not usually occur now these are still compensatory mechanisms of our components to maintain the intracranial pressure within normal limits but what will happen when these compensatory mechanisms fail for example say the brain mass increases to 400 g extra how will the components compensate practically it is not possible in such a case to compensate and now what will happen is an increase in the intracranial pressure the equation will become brain 1800 g plus 50 ml of csf and 50 ml of blood which gives a total volume of 1900 grams it is this extra volume which is going to increase the pressure within the cranium and will cause all the problems in the brain with minimum blood supply 
inability to expand and compression of the brain by the skull. There will be decreased lubrication and the parts of the injured brain and the parts of brain suffering from direct pressure from the cranium may undergo ischemic changes which can cause permanent damage to the brain and stops the functioning of the damaged area. Some parts of brain may also herniate to get out of the compressed cavity which may lead to a fatal problem of the brain called as the brain herniation syndrome. Brain herniation syndrome will be explained in detail in a later video. So now that we know what are the components of ICP, what are its compensatory changes and what happens when there is an increased ICP, let us now know how to treat the problem. You treat it by trying to avoid the changes in the volumes or try to reduce the increased changes to maintain the equilibrium. Thus, to do so, we use the following methods, which are also applications of this theory. First, use of osmotic diuretics in head injuries. That is, they help in reducing the swelling of the brain through osmotic changes, which helps in reducing the brain mass. CSF drainage through shunt. It is especially used when the CSF volume is increased within the cranial cavity as in hydrocephalus. Fluid restrictions are done to reduce the brain edema. Elevation of head to 30 degree allows drainage of fluid, blood and CSF from the cranial cavity. Lastly, if these methods aren't adequate to maintain the intracranial pressure, then a surgical approach to reduce it is taken. Thus, surgeries like craniotomy, craniectomy, resection of the brain tumor, a ventriculoperitoneal shunt, etc. is done. All of this surgery aims at reducing the pressure and maintaining intracranial pressure. A more detailed explanation for these surgeries will be dealt in a later video. So this is all for Monroe-Kelly hypothesis. Kindly remember that these are illustrations and may not be anatomically correct. For more such videos, kindly like the video and subscribe my channel and stay tuned to Layman's Medicine.